Well, thank you so much for coming today. Um, this is a topic that I'm very passionate about. What we're going to do today is talk about um, our youngest patients here at Concord Hospital who have been affected by the opioid epidemic. And what I'm going to do is talk about where we have been in the past in um, our state of New Hampshire, um, what neonatal abstinence syndrome is, and um, how we treat it here at Concord Hospital, and then where we'd like to go in the future um, with this neonatal abstinence syndrome. So I'm sure that you've heard a lot about this already. It seems to be everywhere. Every time that I turn on the TV um, or open up my email, there seems to be another blast about the opioid epidemic. Um, and it's quite scary. Every time that I go to work, I see another baby who has been affected by this crisis. So I want you to just take a minute and think about what have you heard and what worries you. And um, as the presentation goes along, if you have questions, you can just hold them until the end. We'll have a few minutes to talk about it. Um, and I'm happy to stay afterwards if anybody has time and if you have specific questions, we can talk. And then you can contact me anytime in the future about this or any questions you have about NAM. So just about, can you guys hear me okay? okay. So just about a year ago in the Concord Monitor, one of these um, things that popped up was um, pregnant women who are addicted should um, be maintained on drugs rather than quitting altogether. And this, for us in the medical community, was not surprising. This is what we do. But in the lay community and for our patients, um, this is kind of a big deal and big news. And our own Dr. Molly Rosignal, who heads up our program for addictive disorders, was interviewed um, and advocated for, yes, this is true. So the American College of um, OBGYN reaffirmed their committee opinion in 2016 saying that um, for opioid abuse and dependence and addiction in pregnancy, women are in fact um, recommended to maintain on an opioid throughout pregnancy. And there's basically three buckets of women who um, their babies are exposed in utero to substances. And for the majority of my talk, I'm focusing on the ones who have substance use disorder. And these are the, the women who are um, addicted to drugs that are not stable. They're using um, prescription substances illegally or heroin um, or fentanyl, and they're not in a good place, they're unstable. These women need to become stabilized, and, um, and that's what this kind of um, recommendation is all about. There's a second bucket, and those are the women who have been stabilized. And that's considered maintenance therapy um, or medication assisted therapy or MAT. And then the third bucket is women who are using chronic opioids for a medical condition. All of these conditions end up with the baby in the same situation. If the mom is using an opiate, the umbilical cord gets cut when the baby's born, and the baby no longer gets that supply of opiate. So that baby then goes through withdrawal. And the first bucket of women, um, the problem is that those women are not um, giving the baby a, a stable, continuous um, state of medication or not medication, and they're always going through constant withdrawal state. So, uh, um, so what ends up happening is they. Um, Addiction works in a way that with the first or the first few times of using a drug, um, the brain likes it, they get a high, but very quickly um, the craving turns into um, a fix for avoiding the withdrawal. The withdrawal is so terrible, the symptoms are so bad that the um, person is seeking, um, avoiding the negative impact um, of not having the drug in the system. And so the, 
treatment for this condition is um, to keep women in the most stable state, and that's what the medication-assisted therapy is for. So this ATOG committee opinion upholds that we should keep women stabilized on medication to avoid the um, ups and downs of withdrawal. Because for babies, they're going through that same withdrawal um, over and over again, and that withdrawal state um, can cause significant harm. That harm can lead to preterm delivery, um, seizures, brain damage, and even fetal death. And once we started to understand that with this opioid crisis, um, we kind of figured out this is what we need to do for, uh, for pregnant women. And when we know that for all three buckets of women, then neonatal abstinence syndrome, what happens to the baby at birth, is expected, and we can plan for it all the way back from the first time the woman presents to prenatal care. So let's take a look at where New Hampshire falls in the United States. This is from census data from 2012, and at that time, New Hampshire um, had approximately 15 out of 1,000 births. And those are just the women that actually, um, that we know about who are coming in for prenatal care and telling us that they're using um, opiates. This is um, compared to the highest um, number of states here. Um, this Ohio River Valley, Kentucky, Tennessee, West Virginia. Those, that's what we know of um, where there seems to be the highest number of NAS. And if you look at the key, I don't know if you can see it, but the pink area also is 15 to 20. And New Hampshire is at 15. So we really are in the highest number. So if we look at it year by year, the first um, block there is the year 2000. It goes all the way up to 2012. And this is the exponential rise in the number of babies born with neonatal abstinence syndrome. And so this is. Um, just continue to go up. And this is the latest data that we have in a graph form from the New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services. Um, at this time, we were at 15 out of 1,000 births, or 1.5% in 2012. And this just has continued straight up. Here we are at Concord Hospital. So from 2012 until now, 2017, the graph continues. This is now raw number data. We had 72 substance exposed babies in the last, this year. We still have a couple more months to add to that. Um, and this is 72 out of 1,212 births. That number translates into a percentage of 6% of our births currently. So you can tell how exponential this rise in this syndrome has become. The yellow bar here is the number of babies that we've had to treat with medications for this syndrome. So in addition to the numbers, um, this is a crisis for cost of care. Um, and this is what the federal government is very concerned about as well because per baby and the duration of stay and the amount of um, money um, is also exponential. <laughs> if you think of how that rate of rise has been, um, it costs almost $100,000 uh, to care per patient in the hospital, and 80% of those um, charges are reimbursed by Medicaid. <laughs> so that's a lot of background information. Um, clinically, though, what happens in the uterus um, and for the baby? This is looking at um, heroin, which is the first bucket of those moms that I was talking about, compared to the maintenance therapy. So with heroin and those withdrawals and um, back on the drug and withdrawal and back on the drug, we end up with growth restriction and premature babies um, and um, low birth weight and what's considered IUGR. And that's opposed to, um, this is their abbreviation for methadone, or if you've been orphaned, these are the two drugs, um, medications that we use for moms um, in the maintenance. And 
with those, we end up with um, higher birth weights and delivery closer to term. In this study that was in the New England Journal of Medicine with buprenorphine as a, compared to methadone, um, the babies were a little bit closer to term um, <coughs> using buprenorphine. <coughs> So I asked to give this presentation multiple times. I spoke at the New Hampshire Academy of Family Medicine meeting. Um, I spoke to our residency program, and I came to Pam and asked if I could speak to the community because uh, about a year ago in December, I went to ground in the hospital on a weekend, and 100% of my census um, were babies that were being watched for um, symptoms of NAS because they were substance exposed. Um, or they were already being treated for neonatal abstinence syndrome, meaning they were on medication for it. And I felt like, I know this is happening in the hospital, but I'm not sure that the rest of the community does. Um, and one of those patients um, was a woman who I delivered, and her baby ended up staying for 18 days in the hospital. I got to know her very well, and when she was discharged, I asked if I would she be willing to meet with me and, inter and do an interview, and so I spent an hour um, talking to her about her whole course um, through this and her life process and how she ended up where she was at. And her story really touched me, and I said, um, I really need to share this information wider and um, kind of educate as many people as I can. And so her personal story is really why I'm here today. So, you've heard a lot about the background information. Now I'm going to get more into what actually is the diagnosis of neonatal abstinence syndrome. There's two different um, kind of definitions. The, the larger wide category is um, neonatal abstinence syndrome is any substance exposed babies um, who those substances could be um, marijuana, um, anti-anxiety or depression medications, um, methamphetamine, we see all of this tobacco. Um, but some researchers are suggesting that we change this to neonatal opiate withdrawal syndrome because that would be specifically looking at just the opiates because that's the thing that we really need to worry about, um, the ones that have the effect and the thing that we need to treat with medications. However, so many women who are using opiates also are using all of the other substances. So 13% of our women are also on anti-anxiety or depression medications because their life um, circumstances require that they be treated for that. And 85% of women are also smoking. And um, I would say clinically about 30% of women are also using marijuana. And Lately, we've seen a rash of methamphetamine. So the babies really are going through an abstinence syndrome when the umbilical cord is cut. And we have to treat all of those babies. So we can't just say it's just an opiate withdrawal syndrome. So what I'm going to show you now is a video um, from the show The Doctors. I don't know if anybody has heard of it or seen it. Um, it's not something that I generally watch, but it is a really good clip that explains and shows you um, a baby who goes through neonatal abstinence syndrome. It's a little bit hard to watch, um, so if you have a hard time watching, just feel free to look away. Um, and then you can just watch the rest of the information about it. And what is forgotten? Every 19 minutes a child in the U.S. is born with an opioid addiction they have inherited from their drug-addicted mothers. I want you to look at this disturbing video. It's from Cabell Huntington Hospital in West Virginia. What you're seeing is this is a newborn child literally going through opiate withdrawal. And for some of these newborns, there is luckily a happy ending. But these kids, the minute the umbilical cord is cut, so is their heroin supply or what other opi whatever opiate is in her mo their mother's system. It's hard to watch. And about wow. half babies who are born to mothers taking opiates will have symptoms resembling what you saw in that video. Heroin abuse, we talked about, it's nearly doubled in the U.S. There, there, there are a lot of 
people out there who are using it and addicted to it. And of course, when that happens and you become pregnant, the baby can be affected. A former addict, Katie, actually joins us on the phone. And Katie, first of all, I want, I want to thank you for being very open and honest because when you went through your pregnancy, you were abusing heroin, is that correct? Yeah. Katie, did you lose um, custody of your baby when, when this happened? No, I did not. She is with me. And I'm assuming that Katie, even after the birth of your child, who I know went through these withdrawals, did, did that change you? Did that experience change the way you view your life going forward as a mother? Oh, yeah. I mean, I still struggle with the guilt, and I'm not really sure if I will ever fully forgive myself for that. But, you know, I made it my mission to try to help other people. You know, I would like to try to write a book, whatever, whatever I need to do to, to show people that change is possible. And that, you know, just don't give up and don't be ashamed. And is your baby okay? She is awesome. She will be one on Saturday. Oh. And she is, you know, she's almost one and she's, she's right. Well, we wish things. both of you all the best. I think a lot of times, pregnant mothers will actually avoid seeking help because they're afraid of being judged, of being locked away. And we said and pleaded on this show, you know, it's never too late to make a change. And, and we shouldn't judge a mother who comes clean and says, look, I found out I'm pregnant, I've been abusing, I need help. Because if they're afraid to come forward, then we're the ones who are, who are ultimately causing the damage. If we're, if we're not going to allow women to come forward. and. and because that's a scary situation when you acknowledge to whomever it may be, look, I've been abusing, I just found out I'm pregnant, what do I do? I think if we approached it with a compassionate ear and really trying to help the mom and help the baby, because if you help the mom, you're helping the baby, then we might be in a different situation. But as long as these laws continue to exist that just say lock the mom up and take the baby away, then I think what we're doing is we're alienating a group of people that we really could be helping. Because addiction, as we know, yeah. just something that a lot of people do not have control over. And certainly the good news here is that in a lot of instances, um, these babies can turn the corner, live happy, healthy, productive lives. One point that I really want to make about that video is um, we really need to have a compassionate um, kind of ear and be open to accepting um, prenatal patients who are coming forward because if we kind of have any stigma, um, then we're kind of shutting them down. And the only way that we're gonna be able to help the babies is to really open, open up our doors and um, open up our hearts um, and kind of help with this addiction um, crisis because addiction affects everybody. Um, and you know, really this crisis kind of got started with um, kind of pills in New Hampshire. Um, a lot of it started from physician prescribing practices um, and there is a lot of judgment and stigma um, associated with this. Um, and so I think that the video kind of really does a good job of saying that. Um, one other thing that I disagree with is that the babies are not born addicted. Um, babies don't choose to be addicted and that is a behavior. Um, the babies are born dependent um, because they were receiving the medication or the drug or um, receiving it and not receiving it if they were going through withdrawal. Um, so once the umbilical cord is cut, they're dependent on that drug and then they have to start going through withdrawal. And that's what neonatal abstinence syndrome is. And so they need to be supported as they start going through withdrawal. And if the withdrawal is too hard, that's when we start using medications. So the rest of my presentation is going to start talking about how do we support and treat um, babies who are going through the withdrawal at the time of birth. So as you saw in the video, um, that baby was just shaking in tremors and um, increased muscle tone and having a myoclonic jerk. There's three categories um, of what the syndrome, that's why it's called the syndrome, because it's not just one thing that we see. Um, two of them really affect the brain. The brain is very hyper excitable. 
Um, babies are have a lot of crying. They don't sleep in a normal pattern. They have a very um, exaggerated Morrow reflex. The Morrow, if you remember from some of your positions, um, or is the startle reflex. Um, and their tone is very rigid. They're just like this in their beds. Um, and at the most severe um, state, they can have seizures. Um, and then their autonomic system is not functioning correctly. They're, have high temperature, they get very sweaty, um, they yawn, their skin is mottled, their stuffiness, like myself right now. Um, they sneeze and like repetitive like eight times, like sneeze, 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 sneeze. Um, and then this third category is GI disturbances where they're um, sucking um, excessively and they try to feed um, but they can't do it well. So a lot of our um, work has been in collaboration with networks like the Vermont Oxford Network and um, other programs with Dartmouth in particular. Uh, we're also working with Yale um, right now to move to the Eat Sleep Console model of scoring um, the babies differently. And we became one of 110 centers in the U.S. Uh, to meet the designation of um, Center of Excellence that really helped us to move away from using morphine so much for treatment. Um, and additionally, we use the therapeutic arts um, and activity services of the hospital to um, use non-medical therapies uh, for treatment. And that includes um, music therapy, aromatherapy, uh, um, and Reiki therapy, so Reiki um, masters come in and treat both the parents and the babies. Um, and their aromatherapy is really nice. You said the staff get some benefits to that. <laughs> There's a lot of care coordination that goes on um, from prenatal care through the hospital stay all the way to the time of discharge. Um, we have to assess both the moms and the babies' uh, readiness to go home. Um, we have postpartum and mood counselors uh, to make sure that it's a low, um, as low stress environment as possible. Um, and we have our social worker who um, does federally um, and state required reporting to DCYF and also completes our safe plan of care document. We have lactation support counselors, um, they coordinate breast pump coordination, referrals for that. We have our visiting nurses in the community. Um, they come into the hospital now, meet with us every day. The babies are seen on day one and two of discharge by the DNA in, the, in, their, in their homes. Um, there's PCP uh, follow-up and referrals. We have our nurse navigator program. Um, sometimes the nurse navigators come in and meet with the families in the hospital. Um, there's referrals to local parenting support and early intervention to follow up on babies' um, neuro and behavioral developments. So there's a lot of things that happen. So that picture there is a little heart in the middle because it really takes the village to um, support these families on discharge. If you um, heard anything about discharge into the community, um, there's a safe plan of care document that was introduced in 2016 and fully implemented this July. Um, basically, this is our link with DCYF that um, mandates that we report any substance exposed infants um, who are having withdrawal sy symptoms or who might have fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Um, to basically ensure that the family has all the supports and um, referral um, to as much treatment that they might require to ensure that the baby is going to be safe once they leave the hospital. Um, there's a second component to that that requires annual data reporting um, to the number of babies that we're identifying with neonatal abstinence syndrome, the number of referrals that were sent out from the hospital, um, and the number of care services that we're referring to. And I think this is helping the government identify which states are um, hit the hardest and where federal dollars are going to be allocated. Um, there's just some way that they need to um, 
identify and get the money to where it needs to go. So um, I'm in favor of um, getting as much help and support that we can um, in our, for our city through this process. And also to uh, identify the families that need as much resources um, and getting those resources to them um, as best as we can. I also want to um, thank the Dobles Foundation, which helped us get our um, prenatal care coordination program started. So try to identify women as early as possible um, because the more education we can provide families from the very um, first moment that we know that the baby might be substance exposed, um, the better. Um, that way, the more they know what this process is going to be like throughout their pregnancy, um, as well as when they are at the hospital, and how long they might be thinking they might have to stay in the hospital, um, the better it is for all of us. Um, and recently, the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation um, graciously gave us $50,000 of um, its $3 million grant, um, which is going to help support our ongoing um, social worker in the, one of our obstetric practices. And that social worker um, meets with all of our substance exposed prenatal patients and coordinates the care of the, those patients with our inpatient social worker. Um, we will also continue to use that funding to do um, patient teaching. We created this brochure on neonatal abstinence syndrome. I personally have given this out to a few patients in my practice, and it was so helpful because it explains um, the process of what does happen when they come into the hospital, um, how the mom will have um, drug testing to see what substances um, she was using in the pregnancy, what her baby was exposed to, um, and as well as um, that they have the ability to have one-on-one -on -one childbirth tours if they're not interested in doing a big group tour with everyone else. Um, and everyone is encouraged to have a pre-admission meeting with our pediatric hospitalist. It's about an hour long and they go through pretty much everything that I just told you today. And they learn about what's going to happen with the, their baby, when the baby's born, how long it will stay, all the testing, what's going to happen on discharge, um, and everything that's going to happen with the DCYF referral. Um, all that education uh, is very meaningful to them. Um, we will also use um, funding from any extra sources to do ongoing team um, teaching. We all need to be on the same page so that um, we don't have any kind of stigma um, and we can keep supporting each other. This is a really hard job. We have 6% of our babies born um, with these symptoms. We also have 94% of our babies that are just the usual care, and um, these 6% take the majority of our time and our uh, days, I think, um, to kind of run around and kind of take care of. So as a well nursery doctor, um, I usually have about 10 babies to see, and I can plan on spending about 20 to 30 minutes seeing the family, examining um, the newborn, doing all my paperwork. And if I have one baby who has either just being observed, not needing medication or anything, it takes me probably an hour, um, maybe an hour and 15 minutes to explain everything about um, what their mom's drug test, um, urine drug screening showed, what their scores were for that day, what it looks like um, for what's going to happen the next day. Sometimes the babies really need a lot of help with feeding. As I said, <coughs> their feeding is off. They're not sleeping well. Um, they need a lot of extra support. I need to coordinate how the baby's doing with a meeting with our social worker in the hospital. She's calling back and forth with DCYF. I need to have a meeting with DCYF. Um, so it, it really helps to have um, uh, any extra support um, that we can have for all working together and having um, team education is really beneficial. So what's next? Um, how can we kind of 
head off um, neonatal abstinence uh, severity. There has been research done on kind of using methadone in a different way, multiple dosing of methadone, usually methadone is only dosed once a day, um, using it two or three times a day. Really a lot of focus on maternal psychological stress reduction is the key. Um, unfortunately, there's not a lot of studies on long-term outcomes for these babies. I think that's probably a question that a lot of you have. I combed the literature looking for that, and I originally had some slides on what happens with methadone, what happens with buprenorphine, what happens with babies who take methadone, what happens with babies who take um, morphine, methadone, together, combined, everything. And all of it was really poor data, less than 100 babies in each study, um, without really any significant um, long-term neurological, behavioral um, outcomes. The only thing in all of that that I found was that if moms had really good <laughs> psychological stress reduction strategies, they didn't feel stigmatized and they came to counseling and prenatal care and had a stable environment, um, those babies ended up having the best um, long-term neurological behavioral outcomes. And that seems to be pretty much um, the best literature that I can find, the largest studies. And so I think this is really the key that we really need to focus on. Um, and a lot of the research is now going into that. Uh, and then finally, um, multiple studies from these two um, studies talked about the grooming in process and doing a lot of skin to skin care, low lights, everything that I had mentioned. Um, another kind of new frontier that we haven't yet approached at this hospital is potentially using um, buprenorphine for treatment of the babies that do need um, medication treatment for withdrawal symptoms. Um, so we might be looking into that. And that's in place of morphine for the babies. That was um, just came out in May. Um, and then finally, something that is maybe some of you might be interested in is becoming a volunteer cuddler. Um, after the first of the year, we're going to implement um, a program that is going to be a, an intensive training program. You really need to know everything about um, this syndrome, how to approach a newborn who is in a very um, kind of unconsolable state and how to get them consoled. Um, but this is something that we're going to be implementing here. And I look forward to working on that project. And finally, if you want more information, there was two wonderful articles um, in the Concord Monitor in October. One of them is this one, um, where uh, organizations are supporting um, moms who are using substances. Um, and a third place that I would um, kind of refer you to is NPR um, had a story on the exchange on October 31st. That was about an hour long. You can just listen to it if you don't want to read the Concord Monitor. Um, that was also all on substance use and pregnancy and newborns. Um, and all three, the two articles in the exchange um, from the NPR, um, just are much more information than what I just went through. So educate yourselves a bit more. And I ask you to um, take something that you learned today and share it with somebody else. So thank you for coming. Um, thank you again to the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation for its donations um, to us, to the Douglas Foundation, to the doctors who helped me put this presentation together, um, to the doctors in our community who are treating pregnant um, moms with methadone-assisted treatment, Dr. Rosignal and Dr. Ewing. Um, and to Concord Hospital, Family Place Nurses, and to Aaron Collins. Um, thank you for everybody um, for taking care of these babies. This really is a hard job. Mm -hmm. Are you um, familiar with the program that the trust um, created, provided some funding through the Community Services Fund for, for a pilot at Concord OBGYN where um, uh, Dr. Ewing, Rebecca Ewing, is doing some work with the moms 
um, uh, uh, after they have delivered as they go back. Uh, it's our idea in terms of providing some wraparound support after the babies have been discharged and um, helping to support the moms. I don't know whether Aaron can talk a little bit more about that, but that's another support mechanism program that's been in place. And now that it's been piloted for a year, um, it will continue under the 1115 waiver. So Dr. Ewing is seeing patients um, through Riverbend and works at Concord OBGYN um, and through Dartmouth-Hitchcock as well, seeing prenatal patients. And so she is one of the providers in this community who provides the maintenance-assisted therapy for um, prenatal patients. And she has uh, 13 patients that I believe that um, few of them may have delivered already. Um, since this program started and now that they've delivered she will continue to take care of those moms um, and not their babies because I was seeing their babies in the hospital um, who have gone through neonatal abstinence syndrome and they're now discharged and, and so she will continue to see those moms in the community for an entire year afterwards and then after that they will be discharged to a, their primary care provider. Um, so that's what you're speaking yeah. of. Yeah. Does anyone have any other questions? I'm sure you do. <laughs> yeah. How you doing? Hi. Um, can you describe specifically what happened during music therapy for NAS babies? Um, so the question is, can I describe what happens during music therapy for NAS babies? Um, so I'm not sure that there's any literature um, regarding that. So, but. I can tell you just from being in the nursery, um, it, it, it's the calm, quiet, um, it's not quiet, but it's the calming nature of that, um, as opposed to when it's loud and there's like a TV playing and um, there's people in and out and um, babies tend to kind of shut down when there's too much noise going on. And so when I'm talking to parents about when they're going home, if they have too much going on and there's um, a party going on or something like that, what will happen is their babies just kind of um, go, retreat into themselves and kind of be quiet and shut down. Um, so is there anybody specifically, uh, one person who is there being monitoring heart rate, respiration rate. Um, there hasn't been studied yet. Erin, can you speak to that? Yeah, I can. Um, just specifically, though, what happens in the family place is um, there is primarily uh, for music therapy, they use a harp. And the harp and the musician really choose certain pitch tones that are appropriate for that individual baby based on some of the behaviors that we've been seeing that baby go through say in the past hour or past shift. Um, and so it's really kind of customized to the need of that infant. And the nurse, you usually have these babies on monitors, so the nurse is um, monitoring heart rate. You usually see um, some soothing behavior, so they tend to bring their hands to the midline of their um, body or to their mouth. Um, and you just see the muscle tone relax. There's some really impressive results and it, it affects everyone differently, so some results are more dramatic than others. I think the Reiki therapy is similar in its approach. Um, Reiki being a non-hands-on approach, but really an energy um, response, and so the similar symptoms can be improved and similar results like heart rate. Um, the majority of the time is heart rate. And most of the time, those, those therapies result in the baby to be able to sleep and sometimes we've seen that pairing with improved feeding. So whatever the pitch is that's associated with that infant's kind of neurological need at the time, they can become more coordinated um, with their feedings. And so even if that's one feeding that was better than the last feeding, it's a step forward for that infant. Erin, has there been any um, uh, documentation or study as to a reduced need for the morphine as a result of the the therapeutic arts and activities? There is, um, for the three questions that Dr. Yearden uh, spoke about, this, the studies coming out of Yale are uh, seeing a dramatic reduction in the use of morphine um, when they're um, 
taking the approach of really just no, treating the baby almost like normal newborn. Uh, so really trying to encourage early, not letting the, the symptoms exacerbate. Um, it's almost like when you get too far down that road, it's harder to get them back to a, a normal baseline. Um, so seeing um, really that mom is the primary intervention for the infant. The skin-to-skin -skin approach um, is really impressive to watch. It almost has a similar impact to the therapies, the non-medicated uh, therapies. So um, I think it's a, it's a bundled approach is what we're seeing has been the most effective. Um, and I think we'll continue to see our morphine news go down as we get some of these other structural things in place. Um, if the parents can't be here because they're in therapy themselves, or they're caring to other children, or they're having other um, things that get in the way of being able to do that, our nursing team primarily is that skin-to-skin -skin mechanism, um, but we would need to expand that resource pool so that when we have uh, more infants in the nursery and we're not able to do that, on a consistent period that these individuals can help support those infants. So these, these are the things we'll move forward to in the next few months. Don't have a question. You certainly have given me a lot to worry about. <laughs> and <clears throat> if that wasn't enough, I'm gonna ask a question that may cause me to worry even more. Uh, the question is uh, outcomes, neurological outcomes. About four years out, we heard a lot about prenatal situations, birth situations, hospital situations, and final going home. What happens between then and age four when these youngsters enter kindergarten? What kinds of behaviors might they exhibit? And what kinds of accommodations might be uh, requisite for the school to supply? You can probably guess we've got some educators in the crowd. Uh, so my question is, do we have enough information about what sorts of <clears throat> things should occur in the public schools at the kindergarten age in order that these children will be, how shall I say, treated with every possible uh, remedy? Yeah. I think that's a great question, um, and we don't have a lot of answers about that right now because this is such a new diagnosis. So if you think back to that graph that had all the blue bars on it, um, in the year 2000, 2001, there was um, only two babies identified. And so those kids are now 16, 16 15 years old. <laughs> and how would you know that from normal teenage behavior? <laughs> <laughs> I have a 17 year old, I'm just saying. So, when well, we're trying to do studies, we need to have enough people in the study um, to ha have a control group compare comparatively and that those people need to be um, volunteer to be in the study and it's not like um, a disease process that has been around for a long long time that we can um, let's you know just pick like diabetes that we know enough about so we have been learning about this disease kind of like um, we're fixing the, the tires on the car as it's driving. Every, every time we make a little adjustment in what we're doing as our protocol, we, we used to um, give the baby morphine every four hours, and then um, uh, we found out from another hospital that it was better if we treated them every three hours, so we changed our protocol, and then we have to educate all the staff, like this isn't what we're doing, and somebody else comes on and is like, I thought we did it every four hours. Well, that was last week, now we changed it every three hours. And so to, act, to kind of extrapolate what's gonna to happen to children who are four years old, we just don't know yet because it's so new. But the studies that have been done, um, and you know, this is kind of across the world, there's been some studies that have been done, they're very small numbers. They, they show that babies who um, were born to moms who were addicted to heroin and were not in a treatment program, and those moms were um, using heroin and then not using it, and then in a very um, unsettled environment, so you can't really control for their environment. Were they homeless? Were they um, had enough food? Um, we don't know if it was the heroin or what else was going on around them. Um, 
the numbers were like 36 children who are now in kindergarten. Um, they did have cognitive problems and they also had motor um, movement disorder problems as opposed to babies who were compared with methadone stable. So the moms who had children born and they were in a program um, and had a maintenance um, therapy and they probably had a more stable environment where they were able to at least get to a methadone treatment program every day. I don't know if they also had um, food on the table or not, but those children didn't have the same cognitive delays or eye movement disorders. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I don't know what I don't know what the whole world is going to look like in five years from now with the number of babies that we see substance exposed. And I think that the best thing that we can do is to keep educating everybody right now and try to get any moms who are using substances and going through withdrawal into a treatment program and get their lives stabilized as much as possible because if they come to an appointment um, at least to get a medication they're also getting contact and counseling hopefully counseling but some counseling happens with them getting the prescription but um, it certainly suggests that the healthcare professional community should be in touch with the educational community in order to keep the plane flying because you're repairing it as you're building it as you go. Mm -hmm. Is that the proper um, summary? That we don't know a lot yet, but we'll have to discover yeah. it. And the, the education community is, is just as hungry for this information as, as the healthcare community is. They're asking, I, I get emails pretty much monthly for me to come talk to them about what to do for the children in the school. Um, and I'm not an educator in a, in a school system, but they want to know all of this information just as much as everyone else does, and I'm happy to go talk to them. Thank you. Yes? How does the use of, the use of alcohol by the mother affect the treatment of the mother and the baby? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I think that alcohol is a pretty unknown um, quantity because it's very hard to test for alcohol. Um, we've recently changed our screening um, protocol um, and we're getting much better at screening for this. And we ask at, in my practice, I work at the Family Health Center for those of you that didn't hear that in the introduction. Um, we ask every woman who comes in for prenatal care at the first visit, they have to disclose to us. And if they're fearful that there's any retribution, um, or they're just, you know, afraid to tell us that they're using any substances, then they might not. And if they don't disclose it, then we, we have no reason to screen them. But the screening that we do is by urine drug screen. Um, and that screen that we use now is called a pain management drug panel. Um, it has nothing to do with pain, but it screens for maybe 15 um, substances that the mom could be taking. One of those includes alcohol. And since we've changed to that, we found many more women are using alcohol. It's easy to get alcohol. Um, and prior to that, the screens that we did included many opiates that didn't have alcohol on them. Um, I think that um, alcohol use is much underreported in pregnancy. It was very um, kind of well known, don't drink alcohol when you're pregnant. And we did a really good job of um, saying don't drink alcohol when you're pregnant on all the labels of alcohol, but now that this opioid crisis has kind of gotten so um, hot in the media and politics and everything, um, there's been less talk about how bad alcohol is in pregnancy. Um, so how does it affect the baby? Uh, fetal alcohol syndrome is, is terrible, um, and the effects of it are not seen until children start having developmental issues. If it's really severe, you can see it at birth. And, abnormal bases, um, but otherwise um, we don't really see effects of it until the babies start having neurodevelopmental changes so that they're not keeping up with their peers. Is there any last minute questions? Okay, thank you so much for coming. Thank you.